thanks for coming today. Um, Bing. Um, I'm going to talk about ecoevolutionary origins of agency and biological innovation. These are some thoughts that um, arise from conversations with many people, but in particular, uh, Maria, Bea, and Ken. Uh, Maria and, and, uh, and Bea are sitting up here, so you can ask them the questions when you're done about what wasn't clear in the talk. Let's see if I can figure out how to make this move, which I seemingly all of a sudden can't. And uh, I don't know why, because it was working before. Nope. Those are the arrow keys. Craig? Nope. Oh, there we go. Now the arrow keys work. OK, interesting. All right. So um, I have, so this is basically a talk about the origin of life. Um, and uh, the, the sort of two ideas, the, our, the fundamental idea is that life is tenuous at the origin of life, which isn't a big surprise. Um, that there was a gradient of transitions from non-life to life, um, which is probably a surprise for the origin of life community, which isn't really probably well represented here, and that most places on Earth were not initially conducive to life, which probably isn't a big surprise. So what I'm going to talk about today is if, if we, these hypotheses are reasonable, how do we think about the origin of life and how do we study it? So based on those ideas, how should we, how should we proceed? Because the origin of life problem is difficult because we don't have access to it directly. It's four billion plus years long ago, and it turns out there's life on Earth right now, and that kind of makes it difficult to investigate directly. So if we think about how evolutionary biology, um, the, the, the perspective of evolutionary biology that we typically have, so we might be studying, let's say, for example, Darwin's finches, then the model that we get from the modern synthesis and a little bit after that with adaptation and drift is usually sufficient to make us at least feel satisfied that we understand how the things work. There's a lot that we don't know, but we have an idea that our conceptual models at least is appropriate. If you look at eukaryogenesis, there's been ideas that perhaps the standard thinking about the modern synthesis isn't, isn't quite sufficient which has given us something like the idea of the major evolutionary transitions, which aren't in opposition to the standard model. They are kind of a layered on top of it. The adaptation and drift model is still true, but keeping the ideas from Zathmari and Smith, putting them in the foreground, helps us think about eukaryogenesis and the evolution of multicellularity and, the, uh, and other major evolutionary transitions. It gives us a better insight on how to think that might happen. So what's for the origin of life, are those, what's the conceptual model that we have that's sufficient to explain the origin of life? Do we need additional ways that would build on top of these things or maybe that we already, we already have enough? And my argument is that we actually need to think about this a little bit more, a little bit differently. So oh, four-ish billion years ago, life arose rapidly in an environment so these are sort of pre, pre uh, these are sort of precursors for life. They're organic molecules and some sort of sea-like thing. And life arose sort of maybe rapidly over 100 million years which, or so, which is both fast. It's like, well, from nothing to the whole living system, but also really slow because 100 million years is rather a long time. So, so I, the argument is that life was tenuous at the beginning. There was a gradient transitions, and that most places were not conducive to life. So how do we study it? Um, you have this harsh environment. And so there's a lot that we can't figure out. So one way is to cheat. So if you have this life is a gradient from transitions to non-life to life, is that you build some lifelike aspects into the system. In this case, um, PCR. This is a, a slide directly from Maria's talk yesterday, if you didn't catch it. And then you let the system evolve and see if other lifelike processes arise. So this is one way to do it. And so this is, you, you cheat, essentially, and say, I can't, I don't know what the origin of life was directly, but I'll put some lifelike processes in and see if I get more out. But is this, is this sufficient? Is this going to give us everything that I think we'd like to know? And the answer is probably not. Because we really want to know about more about than, than just if I put all the lifelike processes in, can I 
get more life out. You want to have, like, how do I get to these lifelike processes that I'm already integrating? So the other part of that, of my the sort of two um, hypotheses, is that most places on Earth were not initially conducive to life. So that the origin of life is also really about the origin of places that are conducive to life, and that you have the evolution of the ability to live in more in, in less conducive places. So if those are true, so it's a lot of if this is true, then we might think about it this way. Here's our harsh environment, and here's Earth four billion-ish years ago. I'm not really sure it was pink or magenta, but that's just what we have. Um, so you have these bits and pieces of pre-organic, you have organic material. They accumulate places. Um, this is probably true. Um, and what you, they, once they accumulate, other bits and pieces also accumulate. Now, I'm, I'm calling this a sort of eco-evolutionary feedback. It's not evolution in the sense as in the, we normally think about it because there are no alleles, there are no genes probably, but there's pre-organic materials are locally, um, are um, increased locally. And, and so pretty much everybody in the origin of life community argues something, some version of this. Um, and you get more and more accumulation of, of these materials um, by whatever means um, one likes to think about it. Um, um, and what this does is essentially is makes a local environment that's more conducive to life. And that's pretty much where you get something that's, you get processes in this where you have resources and what you end up with these resources is the ability to life to bootstrap itself. Now, I don't know what that means. No one knows what that means. But we, unless you, unless you like one or two alternatives, that life came from elsewhere or that there was some being that generated life, there's some version of this is what we think is true. So here, what you have is a spread of, uh, uh, you have this set where life is more conducive and you have a kind of edge adapter. So this would be a parapatric kind of aspect uh, where you have organisms that kind of live kind of near the parts where close they have resources, but now they can spread. And so you can have a bigger degree of eco-evolutionary feedback because now you might have things that actually have properties that we might be more familiar with, even though they're still not life. And you can, and then as this area can increase in sort of spread to organisms that are able to, e to, to even spread out farther. And then ultimately you get some sort of mechanism for dispersal. So this is a lot of just so story, right? Completely just so story that's very familiar to the origin of life community. But I'm trying to make it familiar to the evolutionary biology in that sense, the evolutionary biology community, because these are processes that we would be familiar with if we had a living system as opposed to one where I'm hypothesizing that goes from non-life to life. Okay, so every does that keep Right, so, and then once it's dispersed, now it's, it's, it's moves in that area, that new area it moves to is, uh, it, it changes that area. And so you get the spread of life on Earth. And so the model, this is completely verbal model, well, it's verbal, literally verbal, plus pictures. Um, my origin of life models, you start out with bits of a material in some environment, a bunch of eco-evolutionary feedbacks happen, and you end up with some sort of replicating organism. So this is, the, this is a pretty familiar model to origin of life community, but with two differences. And the first is that you have an eco-environment evolution. Now I'm calling it an evolution. Again, it's not really evolution in the sense that we're all familiar with. It's a sort of developmental process where you get an accumulation of resources by some means. And there's any number of variety of means. I'm not talking about specific mechanisms. I'm also not talking about special places like black smokers which if you know about deep sea vents, they're there, or high places high up in the mountains where you have karst regions. Those are harsh environments that eco-evolutionary feedbacks are unlikely to occur, and the organisms that people hypothesize occur have to be able to live in, an, those organisms have to be able to live in really harsh environments that organisms now have a hard time with. So this model is that organisms arise in the most benign conditions, and those most benign conditions arise via what we would, what typically we would think of as not evolutionary, but a sort of a 
sort of detritus model. So that's the first difference. And the second difference is that you need the organism to sort of become separate from its environment. So that, so, so that the organism arises in this environment, but it, 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 it becomes different from it. So, so here would be the, so adaptation and drift for how we think about, you know, for most, most of the talks and, 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 and at this meeting. Major evolutionary transitions for understanding maybe multicellularity and eukaryotes and a variety of other things. And this sort of equal, a combination of eco-evolutionary feedbacks eco-environmental evolution, whatever I mean by that, and sort of organism-environment separation. So that is what I'm calling the evolution of agency. Now at this point, you're just like, wow, so this talk, why did I come to it? It's a whole bunch of just so story, and now he's introducing agency. <laughs> wow, really, seriously? So for agency, actually everybody in this room is already familiar with agency. And so here's the, here's the thing that I included you know, from Darwin, you had Darwin's finches, probably everybody in this room, is, if you've taught evolution, you've probably taught about Darwin's finches. Well, he, actually, Darwin's pigeons is better for Darwin because this is something he actually worked with, right? In Darwin's pigeons, he actually, slow though the process of selection may be, misspelled, of course, if feeble man can do much by his power of artificial selection. So Darwin, it's got the agency in this system. And that's the distinction. So in this particular case, what we typically think about is agency. We typically think about it in respect to cognition and choice. In Darwin's pigeons, you actually you make the choice. The experimenter makes the choice. So for those people who do experimental evolution, so it's a, there's a kind of a gradient between Darwin's pigeons, when the experimenter does everything, the artificial selection, and systems that we might think about, like the long-term experimental evolution study, or if you evolve wrinkly spreaders, or if you evolve multicellular yeast, where you control some aspect of the environment. And really, the distinction between these two, anything that involves intervention, but perhaps more broadly, can be thought of as a gradient of agency that's driven by the experimenter. And so this distinction that you have between natural and artificial selection, I think is a good way to think about agency more generally. So, which I'm not gonna get into in too much detail because, uh, well, one, I'm running out of time. So, in summary, life was tenuous at the origin of life. The origin of life involved two-step process, sort of that you get the, uh, the evolution broadly speaking, of conducive areas where life can originate, and then life, um, the sort of, the ability of life to not just exist at that one place, but to be able to move and colonize other locations. And the way to think about that, and I'm calling that the evolution of agency, and the way to think about that, at least initially, is to contrast familiar models of natural and artificial selection that lie at the heart, in fact, of, uh, of what we think of as uh, evolutionary theory. And with that, I'm happy to address or attempt to address any questions you might have. Thank you. So Joan had her hand up first. So I think that I, the way I would think about it is um, degrees of freedom. So um, in, in, as a way, to, so I'm not going to try and distinguish agency from natural selection directly. I'm going to try and argue that, um, because I still have to think about it for, more fully for myself. But for example, for those of us who are familiar with a paired two-way, a paired t-test versus a two-sample test. In a paired t-test, you're controlling for noise, and so you have fewer degrees. You you sort of spend your degrees of freedom of a sort on controlling for noise. Whereas in a two-sample t-test, you let everything vary. And so for experimenters, we frequently add constraints onto the system to control for things, and by doing that, we limit opportunities for evolutionary outcomes because we constrain the system. 
And so one can generalize that more broadly to natural selection, sort of by having species interact and by having coevolution, absolutely. And I, to, to be real clear about that, I'd want to have a nice systematic description about that. And one, I didn't have the time to do that. And two, I haven't really completely fleshed it out myself. But I think that, that would be the way to do it. And so I'm just doing it by sort of uh, metaphor at best. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Uh, I'm done. Great. Hello, everybody. My name is Justine, and I'm working uh, with Juliette Demeaux and Anja Lindstader at the University of Cologne in Germany. I am working on characterizing experimentally the limits of the urban niche of Arabidopsis thaliana, and more specifically towards genes environment association. Uh, but first of all, what is an ecological niche? It's all the conditions, the abiotic and biotic condition required for a species to survive and reproduce. It's specific to each species. And the question is, how can we characterize that? How can we know where a species is able to survive? So the first method is to look in the natural condition where we can find the species. So for example, here we observe species A in this uh, environment, the species B here, and we record all the ecological parameters. But one of the limits of this uh, method is when we have a similar environment, for example, for the species B, but we don't find the species B. Is it because the conditions are not suitable for the species or because we just do not characterize the species here yet? Uh, one of the, um, so we developed a model to infer that, but it's indirect measurement. Another way is to uh, do experiment in controlled condition to really look what is the ecological parameter range that is optimal for the species, such for light, temperature, humidity. But the problem is it's artificial condition. It's not reflecting what is happening in the natural habitat. And here we can talk about, um, about fundamental niche and um, the realized niche. And another uh, very important parameter to take into account is the genetic diversity and its role in the limit of the niche. Because we know that local adaptation play a big role and um, can increase the niche of a species. So for my project, I am trying to characterize the ecological niche by differentiate suitable and non-suitable environmental condition and also determine what is the uh, role of the genetic variation. And for that, I am using Arabidopsis thaliana, not only because it's Arabidopsis thaliana, but because it's also a very interesting species. We know a lot about the geographical distribution, a large scale distribution, but we don't know what is happening at the local scale, why do we find Arabidopsis thaliana here? And um, so for that, I, I am working on the city and an urban environment because we can find many, many different um, environments, very heterogeneous with different constraints and resources. And I'm doing my experiment in Germany, in Cologne, one of the biggest cities. And here you have an example of 500 uh, habitat uh, in Cologne. The color are just um, linked to the, which neighborhood they have. There are, but it's all representative and homogeneously distributed. And in this um, almost 500 habitat, I record different ecological parameters. So here you have the main ones that are linked to the temperature, maximum, minimum, the humidity, soil resources, light, and also the plant community and the density of the plant community. And we can see that indeed we have this very heterogeneous environment we can use as an open air lab to play with and look um, and look how plant uh, is establishing. Um, and the work I am working started um, in my lab by uh, Gregor Schmidt. He found different population of Arabidopsis thaliana in Cologne in very different environment, as I was uh, telling you. So here we can see the pictures of this uh, population that are in the world, pavement, parking lot, meadow, so really everywhere. And we started to study them, and we look at their phenotype. So here you have the flowering time of the population in their natural habitat in the city. And we can say that this flowering time is correlating with an ecological parameters called disturbance frequency. The disturbance is the amount of perturbation a species will, will have. So it could be people walking, dogs scratching, animals, anything. And we can see that we have this association between the phenotype and the environment with later, later um, flowering time with more in more disturbed environment. So we have this association, but 
To go further away, we also look at the genotype of the species and their, uh, and their phenotype in control condition. And here again, uh, we found an association. So the orange curve is the faring time in control condition where we can see we also have this differentiation between the, the populations. So we have phenotypic and genetically um, differences among this population and it's both correlating with the environment. So we have this environment genome phenotype association. But um, we did, so we had a number, limited number of population and it didn't help us to answer the question to, of the limits of the urban niche of Arabidopsis thaliana. So my project, for my project, I um, use a high genetic diversity pool of seeds of Arabidopsis thaliana that I have sown in many environments in Cologne. And all of these environments have different conditions as we have done in the PCA, and it will help me to look which, in which condition are suitable for Arabidopsis thaliana, and also to look at the association between this environmental filtering and the genetic um, of the established population. So for the, um, this high genetic pool, I used two of this local adapted population of Cologne, one is coming from a meadow environment, one from a pavement, but I, most importantly, I chose them because they are the population with the most segregating phenotype and genetic distance between them. And in the F2, I found a lot of phenotypic diversity in terms of uh, flowering time, dormancy, fitness, anything. And for each of this, um, so for this population, I have sown this uh, in four type of typical urban environment for Arabidopsis thaliana, meadow, pavement, ribbon, and wall. And for each of these environments, I have several sites, several habitats. So for example, in the meadow, I have 137 meadow sites. And in each of them, I have sown 1,000 seeds of this F2 population. Same for the pavement, tree bed, and wall. So I have a high number of uh, replicates uh, for my experiments. Um, and the first thing I wanted to, so yeah, here is a map of Cologne. So again, the same map. Here you have some of my population. I also make sure that in the site I've sown Arabidopsis thaliana, my population, I have no pre-existing population, so to not have any bias in my analysis later. Um, and the first thing I wanted to look is where they were able to establish. So here, it's the percentage of established population per site. So on the total number of sites I've sown, in how many of them do I found an Arabidopsis thaliana individual or not? And we can see that for the wall, in almost 80% of the sites, I have an established population at the opposite of the meadow where it's barely 20%. So it really seems we have um, a favorable environment for the establishment of Arabidopsis thaliana, the wall. And it gets more interesting when we look at the population size because we can see that the wall has the smallest population size at the opposite of, for example, the meadow or tree bed. So it's more easy to establish in a wall environment but less individuals are able to do it. At the opposite of, uh, for example, the tree bed, it's more difficult to establish, but more individuals are able to do it. So we have this strong bottleneck effect in the most suitable environment for Arabidopsis thaliana. And now the question is, what are behind all of this pattern? What ecological parameters are um, driven this, um, this effect? Uh, so uh, here again, it's the same PCI as before, just colored by the uh, type of environment. Uh, so just to show you that I have a very heterogeneous um, distribution of the ecological parameters among each type of environment. I also measured all of these ecological parameters in the site where I found an established population and the site I do not find an established population to really characterize the suitable and non-suitable condition. Uh, so here are some of the, um, of the results uh, for some of the ecological parameters. The first one is the light intensity. So Arabidopsis thaliana is establishing in the site who has the most light intensity, which is pretty logical, plants need light. I didn't invent it anything. <laughs> but it gets more interesting when we look, for example, at the vegetation coverage. So it's the link to the plant density and also to the competition. And we can see that for three of the environment, meadow, pavement, and tree bed, Arabidopsis thaliana is establishing in the site with less competition which is also logical, Taliana is not a good competitress. It's called competition exclu um, competitive exclusion. But for the wall, we have 
an opposite pattern where Arbidopsis thaliana is establishing in the site where you have more plants. It's called facilitation. So we have this contradicting patterns in the establishment. And it can get even more uh, complicated when we look at the soil composition. This is the ion on the, in the soil. Uh, and we can see that for, the f for each of the environment, we have a specific ion having an impact on the establishment, but not in the other environment. So here, for example, for the fluorine, which is a soil polymer, Arabidopsis thaliana is establishing in the site with the higher concentration of fluorine, which can be also linked to competition because more soil polluent, less plants are able to establish, so less competition, it's better for Arabidopsis thaliana. And we can find similar pattern for other, um, with the other ions and environment, but for example, the fluorine doesn't have any impact on the establishment on pavement and tribal environment. Uh, I don't have any soil to sample and analyze in the wall, <laughs> but I have another um, method to infer the soil composition and um, all of this parameter for the wall. Um, so the next step of my project was, will be to look at the genetic, um, the genetic of my plants. I will realize low, low um, coverage sequencing, and I will look at the allelic frequency of my established population per type of environment, and I will compare them. I will compare between population, between type of environment, and I will monitor how the allelic frequency is changing and also how it can be linked to the establishment, population size, flowering time, and make the association with the ecological parameters I have found. Another part of my project that I don't have the time to present to you is I am also um, mapping and look for the, um, identifying the genetic regions involved specifically in the interesting phenotype such as flowering time or the germination. So I can really know which gene is responsible for which phenotype and specifically target this allele frequency on the, in my uh, population and see with which ecological parameters are associated. So thank you for uh, your attention. Uh, I would like to thank my both supervisor, Professor Juliette Demo and uh, Anja Ninstater, and all my group and all the other collaboration groups that have helped me, Professor Stetter or Copriva, and of course, all the people that were with me uh, in the field in the city, counting plants with me. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>
So my advisor, Moy, had a common garden where he had 515 whole uh, accessions that have whole genome data of Arabidopsis, and these are from the 1001 Genomes Consortium. He planted them in two environments with two precipitation patterns each and wanted to incorporate local adaptation and spatial models to ask how predictable evolution is across climates. Studying local adaptation across climates is important because with climate change, the strength of local adaptation may also change. Using our understanding of the genetic basis of local adaptation, Moy created this projection which um, detects vulnerabilities to, uh, of alleles to future climates when considering local adaptation. So all of the red points are under this future precipitation prediction where populations of Arabidopsis may be maladapted. And green points, which are, you can't see them as well, but they're more towards the top, they will have alleles that are adaptive. So this study was awesome, obviously, but all it taught us, uh, not all it taught us, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, it, sorry, it told us that some alleles are adaptive and some aren't adaptive, but it doesn't tell us if adaptation will actually happen because adaptation happens on a population level. So for my common garden, I wanted to ask if adaptation of populations would happen depending on the genetic composition of the population, not the individual allele. I also wanted to create a common garden that had a really realistic environmental setup, not just two treatments or four treatments. We wanted to simulate a real environment by creating an gradient of treatments. And to do this, we borrowed from the conceptual framework of range limits that have these qualities. They have populations with different genetic compositions, and also they have a really strong environmental gradient. So we designed this common garden experiment to test the formation of range limits. And you don't have to think about range limits if you don't want to. You can just think about, well, inside the range limit is where adaptation is happening, and outside of the range limit is where maladaptation is happening. And we did this by creating curated populations of Arabidopsis that represent genetic compositions of populations that you might see in nature. And to be clear, we're not that interested in the range limits of Arabidopsis, but rather using Arabidopsis as an eco-evo model to uh, create mock populations that would be found in other species. So this is the garden we built when I started my PhD, and we have rain exclusion and water addition structures. And for our gradient, we created a full factorial design of 14 frequency and abundance precipitation treatments. For the other manipulation in this experiment, we have various population compositions. So we used 352 diverse ecotypes from the global Arabidopsis distribution. And on a single day, we planted 24,000 plants in this garden with the help of many, many volunteers. And you can see several different types of trays here. So each tray has 60 cells, and we planted one ecotype per cell so that we could monitor the genotypes and uh, on a, like, or we could monitor phenotypes on the genotype level. But also, all of the ones that are in a tray together have some type of thing, genomic concept that ties them together and creates our populations. So before we get into the populations, I just want to show you that. Our treatments worked along the x-axis we have in our environmental gradient and fitness on the y-axis, and as it became more extreme, we saw much lower fitness. Now I want you to pause for a minute and think about what a field of 24,000 Arabidopsis would look like. You had some spoilers earlier, um, but you might think green, leafy, boring, lab plant, but I can assure you it is not any of those things. In our field, we saw incredible phenotypic diversity of Arabidopsis. So now I'm going to get into the hypotheses that we created our small populations from. So again, we borrowed these ideas from range limit theory. So for these hypotheses to work, we need a few things to be true, that we have a core and an edge, and the core has many individuals, they're closer together, there's more populations, and the edge has fewer and they're farther apart. And this all exists along an environmental gradient. The first idea is that if you have local adaptation in these two types of spaces and gene flow, you're going to have more gene flow from the core to the edge than the edge to the core, and the edge populations that are the ones in the harsh conditions that need to have be more adaptive 
are going to be swamped or stifled with maladaptive alleles. They're only useful in the core. To test this hypothesis, we created two populations that measure the extremes. So we have a high genetic swamping population and a low genetic swamping population. To do this, we used crosses from one of our collaborators, Francois Vasseur, and um, we, he created crosses of Arabidopsis. We got the F2 seeds from those crosses, and we selected the ones for high genetic swamping have parents from the crosses that have very different fitnesses in a previous drought experiment. And the low genetic swamping crosses have parents that had very similar fitnesses in a previous drought experiment. So this is our simulated genetic swamping. We planted these two populations in those trays in the experiment, and I'm going to show you the fitness curves of these populations. On the x-axis, we have our environmental extremity again, and the y-axis is fitness. And you can see that they have pretty similar uh, fitness curves. And in the most extreme drought treatment, we have no significant difference between the fitness of these two populations. So we don't see much support for this hypothesis. The next hypothesis is that edge populations are smaller, have more genetic drift, and the potential for the fixation of deleterious mutations and potentially higher deleterious load. To test this, again, we created two contrasting populations. Using the 1001 genomes data, I calculated the ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous mutations in all of those ecotypes and categorized them into the highest load, the highest non-synonymous to synonymous ratio plants and the lowest ones. And we planted these in separate trays and put them in the field. And I'm going to show you the fitness curve of these two populations. You can see that in the well-watered treatments, they have pretty similar fitnesses. But as we decline the amount of water they receive, the high mutation load pants, plants have a much lower fitness in the drought conditions, which was kind of surprising to us. A very exciting result that mutation load does affect fitness in drought conditions. And we can consider this on a more continuous level and ask, how does mutation load across all 352 ecotypes that we planted impact fitness in the extreme drought treatment of the experiment? So here's a similar plot, but this is just in the extreme drought treatment. And on the x-axis, you have your mutation load. And you can see there is a significant relationship between high mutation load and low relative lifetime fitness. And then our third hypothesis is that there is a general lack of adaptive variance. So this is the idea that there are variants that would be adaptive in drought conditions, but they don't exist or they don't exist in the right location. To test this hypothesis, we actually have three populations, and we're going to start at the bottom this time. So where would you expect an Arabidopsis population to have many adaptive drought variants? Probably in the most drought place. So not using genomic data, but rather the geography. We selected the 60 southernmost accessions of Arabidopsis thaliana to create a population. We wanted to also find adaptive variants using genetic resources. So for our top one, the dark red, we used a polygenic score, which is normally used in human disease to predict risk, except we were predicting survival from a previous drought experiment. That was our phenotype. And we calculated the number of significant SNPs and their effect size to get a polygenic score for survival and categorized our pop, our, the 1001 genomes into ones that had hot, lots like the highest effect size for drought survival and the lowest total. And then those are our two extremes. So the dark red are drought adapted plants from this polygenic score technique. And these plants are not necessarily from the edge, so it's a good contrast to the geography ones. And the uh, lighter red are the low polygenic score plants. We expect them to have very few adaptive variants. So we have the same plot, except this time we're going to have three lines. And you can see that the dark red and the green lines, that's our drought adapted and our southern edge, have very similar fitnesses throughout the entire experiment, which is really cool, actually. So we were able to pull out variants using genetic information and not geography. So it kind of proves that this polygenic score thing worked. And also it suggests that the southern accessions have adaptive variants, which is also good. But we want to compare these two lines to the maladaptive population. And you can see there is a significantly lower fitness in the extreme drought treatment for the maladaptive 
population of plants. And this is important because with climate change, if climate cha these populations encounter extreme changes or extreme environments, they won't be equipped to adapt to that environment. And again, we can take a continuous approach here and ask the polygenic score of all of the 352 ecotypes in the experiment, what is the relationship with fitness? And we find a strong, significant relationship with polygenic score for drought survival and proportion survival in our extreme drought treatment. So these are the three hypotheses we tested in this garden. We found no support for genetic swamping. We found support for mutation load contributing to decreased fitness in extreme environments, and also support for a lack of adaptive variance contributing to decreased fitness in extreme environments. So I am in the middle of this big data set. It's pretty intimidating, so if you have any experience with that, would love to talk about it. But I really want to build a full G by E model with this uh, data to look at the relative contribution of all of these hypotheses together, accounting for all of the experimental variations that went into this. Here's like a little taste of an MCMC GLMM I made that has the effect sizes of the different hypotheses on fitness. So you probably don't have enough time to think about this, but pretty cool that the high mutation load, the dark yellow, has a really strong negative effect on fitness. We also allowed the seeds and or the populations to re-sow their seeds in their trays the following two years of this experiment, and we've been monitoring these populations for three years now and collecting demography data. So also next steps is analyzing the demography data, and I also have been collecting tissue from all of the plants on time sequences uh, for all the populations in the past two years, and we're going to sequence these to look for evidence and speed of rapid evolution. And with that, I'd like to thank my lab, all of the planting volunteers, and I'll leave you with some cute pictures of us preparing for this experiment. All right, hi everyone, my name is Kathy Hernandez, and I'm a postdoc in Paul Turner's lab at Yale. And today I'll be talking to you about a project I've been working on, looking at how the thermal limits of a marine bacterium can be impacted by an integrated virus. And so a major motivating question for my postdoc work is how we might be able to predict organismal responses to thermal change. And one framework that's useful for thinking about this question that many of you might be familiar with is the concept of a thermal performance curve, where if you imagine body temperature of the organism on the x-axis and performance on some metric on the y-axis, what we often see is increases in performance with temperature up to an optimal temperature, after which there's a sharp decrease until they hit this upper critical temperature or upper thermal limit. And what's nice about this framework is it gives us this quantitative relationship between temperature and performance or even fitness and gives us a starting place for making predictions about how organisms might be impacted by thermal change. But organisms, especially out in nature, are often engaged in um, interspecific interactions that might impact traits that we measure, like their responses to temperature. And so here are a couple studies and examples that I like. One um, in aphids where they found that a point mutation in the endosymbiont bacteria that they carry changes the thermal tolerance of the host. And on the right, an example in stickleback where they found that stickleback infected with these tapeworm parasites changed in their thermal preferences. And while at a conference like this, many might initially think of macroorganisms as the hosts in these sorts of interactions, microorganisms like bacteria can also be hosts in interspecific interactions. And so here we have a bacterial cell with the bacterial chromosome in blue and a prophage or integrated virus in red. And this is the interspecific interaction that I'm particularly interested in. And so these viruses are really interesting. They can essentially remain dormant, replicating alongside with the bacterial chromosome in a process called the lysogenic cycle. Or they can go through this process called the lytic cycle where they excise from the chromosome, replicate their genome, synthesize viral proteins and particles, and eventually burst out of the cell. And so these viruses essentially have this decision-making process to do with very drastically different consequences for what happens to their individual host cell and also potentially the whole host population. And prophage are, prophages are very common in bacterial genomes. So one survey of GenBank genomes in 2016 found that about half of these bacterial genomes were predicted to be lysogens or genomes that carry these predicted prophages. And this process of leaving the bacterial chromosome is called induction. 
And importantly for my interest, induction is a process that can um, vary with environmental factors like temperature. And with a few systems now showing that increases in temperature warming can lead to increases in the amount of induction that happens. And so if we imagine again our thermal performance curve now from the bacterial perspective thinking about this temperature dependent induction, if we have environmental temperature on the x-axis and bacterial population growth on the y-axis, this upper critical temperature or upper thermal limit might be set by something like temperature dependent induction rather than host physiology alone. And we also might imagine that mutations that expand that upper thermal limit might change the way that the host interacts with the phage, potentially reducing the amount of induction that happens at high temperature. And so when I started my postdoc, I wanted to develop a system to study these sorts of questions. And so I went out and I sampled in the near shore waters and tide pools in the Long Island Sound just close to our lab. And I did a sort of random bacterial culturing approach on rich marine media to develop a strain library. And then importantly, needed to look for prophages. And so I did this in two ways. The first is that I sequenced the genomes of the strains in my library and I ran them through various prophage prediction tools that look for hallmark genes like integration related genes or structural genes. And then I also did a chemical induction approach. So I used this harsh chemical that induces a lot of different types of prophages and then plating. And so from this, I ended up with a study system. It's a novel isolate of a um, marine bacterium in the genus Pseudoalteromonas. Um, that has an inducible prophage. And so here on the left, I'm showing the output from one of our prophage prediction tools and a visual representation of the genome assembly. And you can see on the outer edges of this plot that there are two regions where there are predicted prophages. But of course, we wanted to know not just whether there are predicted prophages, whether this is actually an active inducible prophage. And so, um, but one challenge with working with prophages is that if you take the free phage form of the strain and try to plate it on the host that it came from, Prophages often confer this defense called superinfection exclusion, where they prevent the free form of themselves or similar closely related phages from infecting the host. But luckily for us in the process of developing this strain library, we also found a different host depicted in green here that was susceptible to our phage of interest. And so when we plate our wild type phage on this other host, we're able to see placking or clearance and evidence of phage. And so this is great because it gives us a system where we can now use classic microbiological methods to look at changes in phage dynamics. Oh, and just to say there are two different prophages predicted in our strain. All of my evidence at this point suggests that it's one of them that is inducing. All right, and so to my questions of interest in this project, the first is how does temperature impact the population dynamics of the bacteria in the phage? The second, how mutations that expand the bacterial upper thermal limit impact the phage? And finally, how the phage um, might impact thermal responses in a different genetic background. And so first, thinking about how temperature might impact bacteria and phage population dynamics. So um, my hypothesis and predictions here uh, are that temperature-dependent phage replication in the system might limit bacterial population growth at high temperature. And so if this is true, what we expect to see in the bacterial population at low temperature is this classic S-shaped -shape, logistic growth curve. And at high temperature, we expect to see growth growth and then a crash that coincides with lytic phage um, pr production. And then in the phage population dynamics, what we might expect to see is a lot of phage production at high temperature and maybe no phage production at low temperature. And so showing you the results of our bacterial growth curves across temperature with the cooler colors in blue and the warmer colors in red, what we see is that you start to, as you start to push the temperature higher at 35 Celsius, um, maybe you can see here, um, we start to see more unusual dynamics. And then if we push it high enough to 40 Celsius, we start to see growth for about a few hours and then a crash. And so this is consistent with our predictions if there might be temperature dependent phage induction, but of course alone doesn't tell us whether that's what's responsible for this crash. And so next what I did was I took my strain and I grew it both at low and high temperature. And now I track both the bacterial population dynamics and the phage dynamics over time. And so here, again, showing you the bacterial results first, now zoomed into the first five hours of growth. At low temperature, maybe you can't really see it, but there's exponential growth that's happening. And then at high temperature, we see really rapid initial growth and then followed by a crash. And then interestingly, what we saw in the phage dynamics, at least at high temperature, is consistent with our prediction. We see lots of really rapid production of free phage. After about 30 minutes, we see 10 to the 7 phages per mil after incubation at this high temperature. But interestingly, at low temperature, it's not quite as straightforward. There is also a lot of spontaneous phage production. 
And so what this means is that from the population dynamics alone, it's a little bit difficult to say whether this phage difference alone is what's responsible for this crash because I don't know whether the life history traits of the phage have also changed with temperature, but I can say that there's really rapid initial production of phage at high temperature that coincides with this crash. And so next, um, I wanted to know whether mutations that change the bacterial upper thermal limit also impact the phage. And the hypothesis and predictions here are quite simple. And so in our wild type, we know it's not able to grow at this high temperature, in this case 40 Celsius, um, and we know that it spontaneously makes quite a lot of phage. And in our mutants that are selected for growth at high temperature, we might expect to see a reduction in the amount of phage that they make. And so I took a streak plate of my wild type, I picked a bunch of independent colonies, grew them up in independent cultures, and then split those up even further into many wells of a 96 well plate, and put them under the high temperature inducing conditions. And then if we saw any turbidity, any regrowth of the bacterial population, we picked colonies um, and phenotyped them. And so out of 96 wells, we had 11 that were turbid after the high temperature incubation. And then after our streaking and phenotyping process, we confirmed that three of our 11 mutants can grow at high temperature. And just to show you the drastic difference in growth between our wild type and mutants, in the wild type on the top left here, you don't even see anything on this scale. But in our mutants, we see drastically different high levels of population growth happening at this 40 Celsius high temperature. And then next, importantly, we wanted to know whether our mutants have changed at all and how much phage they make. And so I took my wild type and mutant strains, and I grew them overnight, filtered them for phage, and I plated them on our susceptible host to quantify how much phage they've produced. And so on the left here um, is our wild type making 10 to the 10 phages per mil after overnight growth, and in our three mutants, they're making drastically less phage, 10 to the three phages per mil, sometimes below the limit of detection. And so there's a huge difference in how much phage they're making. This was done at a low temperature. I've also done this at high temperature, and they're making even less phage. And so this was consistent with our predictions. Our mutants that grow at high temperature are now making much less phage spontaneously. And then finally, there was an additional phenotype of interest. And so as I described earlier, um, one of the features of prophages is that they can, can confer this defense called superinfection exclusion. And so we wanted to know whether our mutants have changed at all in this phenotype. So I took the wild type phage and I spotted it on the wild type host, the susceptible host, and our mutant. And so in the wild type, um, because of superinfection exclusion, even though there's phage in this sample, we don't see any evidence of clearance in this dilution series. But in contrast, this is what we see on the susceptible host. You see clearance at the high density spots and then individual plaques at the lower dilutions. And in our three mutants, what we saw was that they've now become completely susceptible to the wild type phage. And so what this means is that these mutants that have this ability now to grow at high temperature have drastically changed in the way that they interact with this phage. They're making much less of it and they've now become completely susceptible. And for those who are interested in potential mechanism, we did sequence our mutants and initially I expected that we might find mutations in the prophage region of the genome. But interestingly, all three of our mutants had mutations in the same gene um, on the bacterial chromosome, and in this case, it was a potassium transporter, or a specific protein involved in this one potassium uptake system, which suggests that these mutations might also have other impacts on cellular physiology. And then finally, the last section of this project, which I am currently working on, I'm interested in how this phage impacts thermal responses in a completely different genetic background. And so here again, I'm showing you a dilution series of my wild type phage plated on our susceptible host. And what you may or may not be able to see is that in this high density spot at the top, there's a region where bacteria have regrown. And so these are susceptible host uh, background cells that um, may have become spontaneously resistant to the phage or they could have potentially the phage integrated into their genome, which confers defense against the strain as I've shown you. And so what I can do is I can streak from that region um, and get individual colonies and then phenotype them, also genotype them to see if the phage has integrated in this other background. And so here I'm screening them for phage production on a lawn of the susceptible host. And here's our wild type strain where you can see clearance around the spot indicative of phage killing of the susceptible host. And here we have the susceptible host spotted on itself as a control. And then here I have an example of one of our phage positive colonies, which we've now sequenced and confirmed that the prophage has integrated into this other background. And so I'm doing a little bit more work to figure out where exactly it is in the genome. 
Um, and then I'm doing some phenotypic assays to see exactly how much phage it makes across temperature. Um, and then excitingly, what is really great about this setup now is that I now have um, two strains where the major difference between them is just that one carries the prophage and one does not, so I can better um, determine what the role of the prophage is in shaping thermal responses. And so again, revisiting our thermal performance curve, um, I think this work is a good example of how this upper critical temperature can be shaped by interactions with other species. In this case, we see lots of lytic replication happening at high temperature and how mutations um, that enable the expansion and change of this, post, of this um, thermal performance curve impact interactions with phage. And so with that, I'd like to thank my advisor, Paul, and all of the Turner Lab who've been so supportive in this process, and especially undergraduate Jamie Chaw, who's helped me both in the field and the lab on this work. I can take questions. region of this specific strain, there were no mutations. The only non-synonymous mutation that I saw in our mutants was in this potassium transporter, but I am interested in doing some actual experimental evolution with this strain at high temperature to see whether those are the mutations that might enable adaptation or whether we might see something else, because I actually think that it might be a bad thing. We, that we, we, mutants have um, lost the super effect of fusion, and so, yeah, but I haven't seen any differences in the prophage region um, in my 